Most Christians, I think, are familiar with the concept, if not the precise workings of confession. For those of you who don't know, in the ancient churches, confession is one of the sacraments or the mysteries, and it is the sacrament which affects upon the repentant sinner through the actions of a confessor or a father confessor, normally the parish priest, the forgiveness of Christ. And I'm not going to go into the theology of surrounding that exactly in this video, because I'm not sure that that can adequately be discussed in this format. What I'm interested in here is the differences between how a medieval person experienced and thought of confession in the context of their ecclesial worldview and their societal worldview, and what elements of that might be quite surprising to us here in the modern world. The first thing to point out is that I'm going to be talking about quite a wide sweep of what we call the medieval era. It would be foolish to put exact dates on it, but generally I'm going to be talking about the emergent liturgical mindset that was seen at the end of the Anglo-Saxon period through uh, into around the beginning of the 14th century. And by that I mean prior to that increased emphasis that you get on personal piety in the 14th century and 15th century but after you've begun to see the notion of the corporate parish, or at least the localised Christian community and that life in England. And I'm also going to be thinking here about the general man, the peers ploughman hanging around the nave during the divine service, rather than clerics or the higher nobility, who I think would probably have had a more complex relationship with the sacraments, owing to the accessibility that they had to private chapels and to foundations and to confessors and priests and so on. So, if you were a medieval farmer and the time for confession came around, what would you have thought and what would you have experienced? Well, the first thing to note is that the frequency of confession seems to have varied enormously between time periods and regions. We know from first-hand sources that throughout the medieval period a general trend continued which dates actually all the way back to the three and four hundreds when you first get the bishops complaining about this phenomenon and actually most notably John Chrysostom in, Constant in Constantinople complaining about it that the laity were beginning to withdraw themselves of their own volition slowly from the practice of regular communion. And this is something of a debated point, and it's much more true in some areas than in others, but the general trend is essentially incontrovertible, and it runs contrary, actually, to the generally held belief that it was the sort of devious medieval clergymen who were purposefully withdrawing the sacrament from the unclean hordes of the laity. Uh, and, and, and that notion is, is sort of connected with the fashion that was emerging for the throwing of the sort of cordon sanitaire around the sacrament, um, which really took off in the 900s and, and which really reached its apogee in the high medieval era. Um, and doubtless there was some of this involved as well, but actually that slow withdrawal of the medieval laity from reg regular communion was counterintuitively, at least according to the primary sources, um, borne out of a growing sense of piety in, in, the, in the laity themselves. And actually, I think this is, this is something which many traditional Christians today um, and Christians in the liturgical churches can probably relate to more than we care to believe. Um, as the theology becomes more sophisticated and as the understanding surrounding it becomes more sophisticated, these lay devotions surrounding the sacrament begin to flourish. And there's also a simultaneous desire not to therefore pollute the object of the veneration. And also, I think, a fear um, that the sacrament will, as the prayer before the reception uh, of the priest puts this in the sorrow muse, be unto me for judgment and condemnation, that it's actually uh, probably too dangerous to be approaching on a weekly, on a weekly basis. So without getting too bogged down in a discussion about the precise frequency of the communion in whatever generically medieval time period location and station in life you might care to imagine yourself in let's 
presume that you are communing of the sacrament on major feast days and on a few other special occasions in the year. Perhaps we're talking about five or six times a year. And this will allow for times when you might be expected to commune uh, outside of the high festivals, such as baptisms and weddings, um, as well as the standard Christmas and Easter, which is mandatory, and possibly also, depending on where and when you are, with the addition of Whitson and Rudmus. And just to connect that here, think about the penitential function of the Ember Days in particular. And that is, I mean, that's outside of the scope of this video, but it's an interesting connection. So in the run-up to Christmas and Easter, there will be general parish confessions, which are held in the days uh, before the festival and following the period of the, of the great fast of Advent and Lent. And these are times when it is absolutely compulsory for everyone in the community to commune together. And we must imagine a situation where the priest is really working overtime, especially on Holy Saturday, as people try to confess as close as possible to the time of their communion to cut down on the risks involved. So confession and communion at this point are really entirely interwoven together. Having gone to confession was, and it still is, a mandatory requirement for the participation in the Eucharist. It was unusual during the medieval era for someone to confess outside of this context. And we're not yet seeing that semi-decoupling, which really begins in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries in the Roman Catholic Church, where confession is almost, though still actually in the modern day, not entirely separate a separate liturgical function so that for example by the 19th century you begin to see in roman catholic biographies of saints and hagiographies an emphasizing of holiness by how many times a week or even in some circumstances in some instances how many times a day they attended confession and this is not the case in this context if you look at this image of the seven sacraments altarpiece, you can clearly see that connection displayed by the arrangement of the figures. The man sitting down with the fur hood on is the priest, hearing the confession of the man in front of him. Importantly, he sits at the entrance to a chapel in which Mass is being celebrated, and that emphasises the natural and expected flow of the faithful through confession into the Holy Sacrament as a sort of guarded gateway. And this is a theme of the painting generally, this flow through the sacraments, but it's, it's a, a little insight also, possibly, uh, possibly subconsciously, uh, I, I, I'm not sure, into at, least, at least into the mind of the artist, which is really, I think, quite telling in this tableau. So, you are a medieval farmer and it's the vigil fast on Holy Saturday. Now, nobody's working today because it's the vigil fast of Holy Saturday. So now is the perfect time to get your mandatory confession in before receiving the sacrament at the Mass this evening. And so what would have actually happened? Well, I'm going to presume for the purposes of this video that you live in a bit of an idealised parish setting where the priests have all of the trappings and he knows what's actually going on. And needless to say, this isn't always the case, but without getting into a lengthy, a lengthy and sometimes bizarre discussion on the idiosyncrasies of the rural medieval parish clergy and its appointment and, and their appointments, let's Imagine that you are um, uh, that your priest is venerable and well dressed in his decorated Gothic parish church, with its well proportioned nave and a rude screen, and it's there that you're going reluctantly. You amble up to him to have him hear about all of the terrible things that you've done in the last few months. Now, the first thing to notice is that there's no little wooden booth. There's 
these confessionals, as they're called, are entirely unknown in the medieval world and are still actually unknown pretty much everywhere except within uh, Roman Catholicism. Uh, so the priest actually sits in the open uh, in front of the rood screen or sometimes uh, in front of a pillar nearby and, or rather some other convenient nearby place. And he's sitting on what was thought of as a, as, as a utilitarian, so it doesn't have the same kind of emphasis of sanctity placed upon it as, say, some of the, uh, some of the items associated with the sanctuary do. Um, but it is still thought of as one of the most important items of church furniture, and that is the shriving stool. The word shriving uh, is what medieval people called confession. To shrive is to confess. So you didn't go to confess, you went to be shriven. And the origin of that word is an Anglo-Saxon word, and it's connected with the notion of something being uh, prescribed or entered into a book or written down. And it refers actually not to the act of speaking the sins to the priest, but to the act of the priest imposing the penance. And that was considered in some sort of mystical sense to have been inscribed as a judgment in the same way as one finds judgments um, uh, inscribed in the book of Revelation and in law courts in the medieval world. So that is to say, in a sense, that the emphasis here in the language has shifted 180 degrees from the way that we are actually used to thinking about it. The mind goes first in the language, not to the act of the actual confession, but to the penalty. You are going to hear what sort of punishment you were to receive, rather than the emphasis being placed on telling the priest or God something as, of course, God already knows what it is that you've done. So we might think about this more in the sense that we would have if we referred to confession in the modern day as a sentencing hearing, for example. And actually, that's quite an apt analogy because the judgment has already been passed. And all that remains is to discern whether there are any mitigating factors and what a suitable uh, pen penitential or rehabilitation program might look like. The magistrate or the judge acts in the secular context for the crown and more generally for the nebulous concept of the law, and it's the Queen's justice which is being dispensed. And in a similar way, the emphasis here in the medieval mind is placed on the priest as having the role of executor of the divine law, of the divine order. The key difference, of course, is that when you go to this sentencing hearing, you essentially know that all will be forgiven, and that Jesus Christ has taken it on him, in your mind, probably in a somewhat nebulous fashion, your sins and or proper punishment. So I should say that I'm not making any statements here about the validity of this view. I'm just stating it as an observation, and I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of the theological interpretations of the mystery of the sacrament or anything. The concept of the priest as a sort of magistrate is continued by the fact that he is sitting on this shriving stool, which is, for all intents and purposes, associated as the seat of judgment on which secular magistrates would also sit when making their circuits of the country and dispensing the king's justice. A lot of the time, especially in the late Saxon period, we've got to think about uh, these justices being carried out in an outdoor context, um, and the magistrate would have brought to him or, or have brought with him a similar stool from which the shriving stool is ultimately derived. In some later, in, in, in later times, these stools um, developed into sort of small throne-like uh, structures, which I, I think may be the origin actually of the, of the Roman Catholic confessional. Uh, but, but in any case, these developments actually didn't develop independently. They mirrored, they simply mirrored the, the fashion for uh, the the judges and the magistrates' benches 
uh, becoming increasingly elaborate in fixed law courts, for example, in, in Westminster. So it's very much the same concept and one which would have in a world where prisons were really yet to be invented in the modern sense and where justice was, as a consequence, compelled to rely upon much more immediate forms of punishment, such as physical penalties, brandings, having a hand chopped off, etc. And the seizure of wealth items and fines, uh, which weren't just monetary, but also you have to think about this in terms of, in terms of flocks, cattle, other wealth-related items uh, and conjoined uh, in your mind with all of these sort of foreboding images uh, which were very public spectacles and this last element is interesting to me because I think it's actually an overlooked element of the sort of atmosphere that later contributed in Western Christianity to that increased juridicism that you started to really see come to fruition in the 15th and uh, and in the 16th centuries as well. So, you approach the priest and you kneel down in front of him in full view of your friends and neighbours. And thankfully, the priest is equipped with a sort of long rod which he uses to ward off loiterers who might accidentally wander into his orbit or into earshot of what you're saying to him. I did at one point find a couple of images of these rods in use, but I, I can't find them anywhere now. Um, so it, 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 it's a sort of ash staff and we're talking maybe eight feet long, painted white, and he uses it to sort of poke people away from, from the area of the confession if, if they get too close. Uh, amusingly, this rod developed a bit later into a method of the priest bestowing a sort of socially distanced blessing on people as they came past and as he was hearing confessions. So they would they would come into this orbit and kneel down and he would sort of poke them with a or tap them with on the shoulder with this with this staff. So the priest is wearing a cassock. And he's wearing a surplice and in most places in England and, and, and the Netherlands uh, and Germany, although by no means everywhere, uh, and you do see images of both, he's also wearing a stole. The item of clothing which would make the most impression on you, however, is, and I'm going to presume that your priest is a canon here, is the almus, is the fur almus. Not going to go into a huge detail about what that is as I've already made a video about it. Um, however, suffice to say that it's a sort of capacious fur hood with teddy bear like ears, as you can see in this image from the Van der Vaden. And for whatever reason, and I'm genuinely not sure what the reason is, confession is always heard with the hood pulled up. And this seems to be very early development. Uh, and my suspicion is that it comes from some form of earlier hat or hood related vestment situation. On the other hand, it may be purely a convention to keep the priest warm while he's setting in a cold church for an extended period. And knowing the medieval clerical mind, which preferred at all times to be as muffled as possible, honestly, this second reason is probably closer to the truth. So you are kneeling in front of the priest. The first thing that he's going to do is a sort of preface to confession proper. And this is the time and the space where the majority of catechesis was carried out. Contrary to the popular belief, the medieval peasant was essentially always catechized one-on-one -on -one with the priest. The best idea of what actually ensues now once you've kneeled down in front of the priest is probably if, if you have a look at the catechism which is contained in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer and which seems to be derived both in setup and in content pretty directly from 15th century records of this practice. So the priest will go through a series of question answer sessions with you and he's going to require you to give precise reasoned answers on quite a wide ranging theological syllabus and the absolute minimum 
absolute minimum by church law was that you should be able to say, say entirely and without hesitation the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer and the Ave in Latin and be able to explain clause by clause what the significance of these things were. Now, could you do that? I'm not sure I could do that in this setting, at least. Incidentally, once you see the nature of this regular testing, and once you recognise that it existed as, as quite a prominent aspect of the medieval liturgical culture, you'll start to notice trends in medieval homilies uh, which focus on expositing the creed clause by clause or expositing the, pa the pater noster clause by clause, giving a sentence normally in Latin and then going into detail in the vernacular about what it means and what, and what sort of thing, essentially, what sort of thing should be repeated back to the, as a narrative to the priest at the shriving stool. And it's, not, it's no coincidence that these sermons are focused on these penitential seasons, particularly in Lent and in Advent. In one of my previous videos, I did a reading of a popular medieval poem called How the Ploughman Learned His Paternoster. And in that poem, there is a tableau of exactly this happening. The ploughman goes, which is a sort of capture, it, it's like saying Joe blogs today. Piers Plowman is, is the man in the street. So the ploughman goes to his priest to be shriven. Uh, and he says, uh, the poem says, great good he gat, and it's talking about the ploughman, great good he gat and lived years 40, yet he could not pat a nostra nor ave. In Lent, the time the parson did him shrive, he said, canst thou say thy believe? That is, can you say the creed? And the ploughman said unto the priest, Sir, I believe in Jesu Christ, which suffered death and harrowed hell, as I have heard mine elders tell. The parson said, Now let me hear thee say devoutly thy paternoster, that thou in it no word do lack. Then said the priest, What thing is that which you desire so here to, to hear so sore? I never heard of it before. The priest said, To learn it thou art bound, or else thou livest as the hound. Without it, saved canst thou not be, nor never have sight the deity. Which church to be banished I, all they that cannot their paternoster say. Therefore I marvel right greatly that thy belief was ne'er taught thee. I charge thee upon pain of deadly sin, Learn it, if heaven thou wilt win. It's a good poem, and if you want to hear it in full, I've put a link to it in the description. Needless to say, the, the, the conniving priest tricks the recalcitrant ploughman into learning his paternoster in, in quite a bizarre and convoluted way. And the moral of the story is put into the, the mouth of the ploughman at the end, which is, While that I live certain, priests shall I never trust again. So let's presume that, unlike the ploughman, you managed to get through the questioning phase and into what we think of as the confession proper. Now, as a well-rehearsed medieval layperson, the next thing which you're going to do is you're going to place your hands together in the, in the form that we associate with prayer, and you're going to place them between the hands of the priest. Now, the enormous, enormous symbolism of this act cannot be overstated. And in fact, it explains one of the key, one of the key thought motifs of the medieval period. Those who are au fait with medieval customs, and particularly those surrounding the concept of oath taking, of lordship, and of serfdom will already have alarm bells going off in your head at this point. The act of placing one's hand in this way within another person's hands had to the medieval eye one overwhelming association because it is the action of a man or a woman taking an oath of homage or an oath of fealty to a lord. In the secular world, 
one became the notional man or the retainer or the serf or whatever, the, the man of a higher noble or a landowner. And this was true from, from barons down to peasants. By placing the hands together, which is a gesture of humility in itself, and which is the reason why we associate it so strongly with prayer, and of placing them between the hands of the Lord and saying something along the lines of, Sir, I enter your homage and faith and become your man by mouth and hands. Uh, by mouth and hands, that is, by taking the oath by the mouth and by placing the hands between those of the Lord. Uh, and I swear and I promise to keep faith and loyalty to you against all others. And then what would happen is you would be received by the Lord uh, and you would be given an instrument of some sort, a bill hook or a sword or another implement which denotes your new station in life and your new start, essentially. And thereafter, you wouldn't be able to leave that service because you'd taken the oath unless and until you, released, you were released by your new Lord. So what does this mean? What are you doing here in the context of confession? Well, on one level, that's, that's really clear. You're swearing fealty to God. You've erred and strayed, and now you are pledging your allegiance to him once again. As much as the forgiveness element, this is the element of the right which carries the most weight for you as a medieval person. And no wonder, given the fact that this the, the entire secular world, the entire secular world is organised and run on this principle of fealty and on the basis of these of these oaths by hand and mouth. In a word, in a world which has uh, limited recourse to written contracts, oaths are the primary vehicle both of social business outside of the immediate family structure as well as the primary recourse of justice and of commerce and merchant mechanism and so on. So there's that, but there is also a deeper level at which this would be highly significant to you. In taking a secular oath to a Lord, you have vowed to him to become part of his household. The primary function of the Lord from that point onwards thereafter is the provision of food and particularly bread to you. Indeed, the origin of the word Lord is the Saxon Leofman, uh, which is loaf man or loaf giver. So he is bound, as much as you are bound to him, he is bound in return for that, uh, for that fealty to invite you to his table and he's bound to provide you with food and with bread. And it's for this reason that during periods of famine, there are huge spikes in the number of people who are wanting to swear fealty. And it's why in medieval wills, one of the common clauses that you're going to often find is, um, is the bestowing of freedom upon all who, and it says, all those whose hands I took in evil times. And it's a reference to the freeing of the serfs who had uh, who had to fall back on the local lord as a sort of uh, socially corporate welfare safety net during these times of real hardship albeit one where you you know lost your freedom um, now by sinning you have placed yourself outside of the household of god which is of course the church so by swearing fealty and 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 just draw the connection here between um, between that association and things like the ejection of penitents at, um, at 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 Lent, so by swearing fealty, you are entering again, in a way which would be much much more immediate than you might be used to thinking of, back into that household, as a servant and being consequentially invited to that Lord's Feast, which in this context is the Eucharist. So you see, it's a really short step from one of those associations to the other. And it's that association that was overwhelmingly the root of 
this uh, spiritually of the exercise for many people uh, and of the sacrament outside of course of the actual absolution so you're going to swear this oath as the priest uh, as you this is the point where you are actually going to make your confession proper so at the at this point the priest will sort of pull forward the hood of the almus so that the hood falls over and covers the eyes this wasn't a universal practice but it seems to have been a common practice uh, in england so this is clearly a symbol somewhere between the concept of blind justice and blind wisdom and the concept of seeing no evil for me it's difficult to put my finger on exactly what that archetype is that's being engaged in this context but it also seems fairly obvious on a practical level it also and i can confirm this from personal <laughs> experience it also allows the priest and and actually this shouldn't this shouldn't be overlooked as as a real as a as a real reason for this happening to sort of blinker himself and to uh, and to focus from this point onwards solely upon the kneeling penitent and it, it it's quite an intimate situation there's no exact formula for how to give your confession proper there's a standard blessing and most manuscripts prescribe a preface before the recitation of the sins of the penitent and the broad outline is sort of familiar and it goes something along the lines of first I acknowledge myself guilty unto almighty God to all the company of heaven and to thee my spiritual father that since the time of my last confession I have offended my Lord God grievously and especially at which point you're expected to recite your sins there then follows an interesting conclusion which both reinforces the similarity between the oath of fealty and a slightly more complex understanding of the role of the priest than occurs in the modern pared down versions of this so you say for these and all other known and not known that ever i did since i was born unto this day i ask of god mercy and most merciful lord god i yield up myself guilty unto thee and I utterly commit myself unto thy grace, pity and mercy, and I pray you, my spiritual father, to be between my sin and me, that God of his mercy forgive me for this my lowly confession, that I may be delivered from my spiritual enemy, and obtain the endless bliss until which God hath brought me, wherefore I pray. And this is interesting to me because there are echoes here of, of the notion of Moses standing in the gap between the vengeful God of, the, of, of, of Israel and the Israelites uh, to protect them from the deity, as well as the similar functions of intercession and of, uh, and of prevention exercised by the Old Testament prophets. And I don't want to labour this point because it's not explicit and it's not theologically elaborated on, but the notion of the priest as standing in the gap between the sinful penitent and the wrath of God or between the sinful penitent and sin and death is a recurring motif in some aspects of especially early medieval rites both actually in the east and the west and it seems to me to have a, a sort of common origin in any case the use of sarum contains echoes of this theology of the priest in the guise of old testament prophet essentially throughout it and this is one of the points at which it, it shows through a little bit quite how well formed the concept was in the medieval mind is, is I think open to debate but I can tell you that I have been exclusively exposed to the use of sarum now for for years and it's a concept which becomes an expected aspect of the rhetoric surrounding the vengeance of God and particularly the judgment of God and again I'm not making any theologically definite statements here but is it is something which to my knowledge appears to have dropped over time from most later liturgies in the, in the east and in the west
So following this, there's a period in which the priest is supposed to do the most terrifying of all things, which is perform an ad libitum and yet liturgically and contextually sensitive prayer. And this is not the only time when the rubrics in the Sarum use tell us that this is supposed to happen. And the most unnerving and surprising one being right bang in the center of the canon of the mass following the opening of the supliches. I'm not gonna to touch on this any more than to say that it happens and it's maybe surprising uh, and it's a recurrent element of medieval liturgies. Evidently, medieval priests were expected to engage in spontaneous prayer in the same sort of way as our Protestant friends expect from their pastors. And to an extent that, you know, modern Orthodox and Roman Catholic priests would, I think, have quite a hard time coming to grips with. In this instance, thankfully, somebody's taken the time to write example prayers, which might be said to fill in this space if the priest is struggling to come up with something himself. And um, these focus on the priest requesting grace to carry out the work of the sacrament and an emphasis, unsurprisingly, on the priest being a vehicle for Christ and not trying to perform the commission of his own merit. So after the prayer comes a question answer session, a discussion and a giving of the penance. And we're quite familiar with this concept, I think, in modern confession. I'm not going to talk about the modes of penance here because that's a whole video and more in itself. But again, I think that we have to recall at this point when we're talking about penance, the notion of the priest as magistrate on the stool rather than the concept of a friendly chat with your local Father Brown. Though, of course, these things are going to shade into one another to some extent. The standard form of absolution is given, uh, which I believe differs slightly from that of the later Tridentine use in the Roman Catholic Church, but I must admit I'm not overly familiar with how that operates. Um, the priest is instructed to place his stole over the head of the penitent during the absolution uh, in line with what at the time and, and in the East at least still is, is still the common practice. So with the exception of the benediction which happens at the end, that is pretty much it. Now I've, I've never been to confession except in the use of Sarum and once or twice many years ago when I was an Anglican. So I'm unable to comment on what the difference is in experience between these two. However, I have shriven and been shriven by ex-Roman Catholics. And it's clear to me that there is a real, mm, there, uh, th there's something of a different charism going on here. And, and there's a, because there, there's a, a time that has to be allowed for adjustment to, this, to the new way of doing things often. For a start, there's nothing you can hide behind in this form. The manuals are very clear that you have to be very explicit about the sins that you have committed and you can't hide behind general formulae. You're right there in front of the priest, face to face, and there is no sense of anonymity. Indeed, the notion of anonymity, of privacy, is largely contrary to what the expressed preferences of the medieval clergy were when it came to these sorts of these sorts of rites. So you were supposed to be known intimately by the person who was shriving you. And the manuals and the, 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 the laws from the bishops tell us that if you are going to go to another parish to be shriven, you should at the earliest opportunity go back to your own parish priest to repeat that confession to your own priest. And if you are a priest and someone you don't know comes to be shriven, you are, you are supposed to shrive them, but you are also supposed to, as a penance, send them back to their own, their own priest to repeat that confession. And this ties in with the notion of spiritual guidance, and particularly, I think, the catechetical element of the ritual. This is a process which demands something of you. 
it requires in some sense that you prove yourself able to function within the Lord's household before you are admitted, insofar as it requires that you are able to rehearse the fundamentals of the Christian religion. I personally am shocked when I hear confessions some, from some new catechumens, uh, which we hear without giving the absolution. Um, at the state of the catechesis of the laity in, in most churches. And this isn't meant as a criticism. It's simply an observation that where the practice continued in other bodies today, where that practice continued of face-to-face, one-on-one catechesis several times a year in the context of confession, it might go a long way to solving that problem. But... Um, and you know were were that we were all as well versed in the fundamentals of religion as the average medieval ploughman appears to have been so it's a very rich service um, and possibly because of its nature as a prelude to the mass which is a much more exciting ritual is often rushed it's often overlooked in the modern world Uh, it's worth asking i think it's worth asking the question how well Do you think you would fare if you were accidentally whisked back in time to a medieval shriving stool today? Thanks for watching. I've had a few comments recently asking if I'm okay and where I've been. And as this is the first video that I've done in a long time, I can assure you I am fine. Unfortunately, the demands of a fairly full-on secular job combined with the studying for postgraduate qualifications connected with that and on top of that my duties toward the church uh, have left making youtube videos quite a sad fourth place Um, i I think the plan is probably going forward to make a few larger videos rather than many small ones i promise at some point i will finish the sarum calendar videos so that we have a complete year don't worry i'm fine but your prayers would be appreciated in what is quite a a hectic time thanks for watching if you like what we're doing or if you want to help support our mission please don't forget to like and subscribe i hope to see you again soon benedicat vos omnipotens deus pater et filius et spiritus sanctus amen